Yeah, Professor Graham Milton was born in Sydney, Australia. After his basic education, he moved to uh, for his PhD in Cornell University. In 1985, he obtained his PhD and then DSc from University of Sydney. He was a professor of Current Institute, uh, New York University, from 87 to 94. Since then, he has been at the University of Utah, where he served as department chairman from 2002 to 2005, and is currently a distinguished professor of mathematics. He's from 15 to 18, he was also a visiting chair professor at Case Mathematics Station, Korea. He's a recipient of several awards like Sloan Fellowship, Packard Fellowship, Ralph E. Kleinman Prize for such bridging the gap between mathematics and applications, Society for Engineering Science Prager Medal for Contributions to Theoretical Mechanics, and the Lilio Livia Civita Prize for Mathematical and Mathematical Sciences. He's also a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, CIAM. He primarily works on composite materials and metamaterials, but also on networks, theories of clocking, minimize some of the important topics, minimization variation of principles for wave propagation, first Fourier transfer methods for computing fields in composite and inverse problems, among other things. Probably many of you have known about his book. It's a kind of Bible and a huge book, The Theory of Composites. And he has written nearly 200 papers and chief contributor to the book, extending the theory of composite to other areas of science. To his credit, he has 16,000 citations of his work with the net index of 58. Has been on the organizing and scientific committees of many conferences there, metamaterials and composite. Professor Graham Milton, stage is yours. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to join this conference. Um, Yes, yeah, so this is a uh, talk about beyond homogenization. Uh, and of course, as you're all aware, homogenization is basically when you have a uh, microstructure much smaller than the uh, other characteristic lengths, such as the size of a body, or for waves, the size of the wavelength. And uh, what we're interested in is, of course, when we drop that assumption, um, naturally, there's been a lot of uh, studies, the response of inhomogeneous bodies. But what I'm really interested in here is uh, what tools that apply to homogenization can be adapted to the case when there's no separation of length scales. And so this is joint work with many people listed here, um, uh, contributing to various degrees. Uh, and uh, in particular, Daniel Onofrey, who's one of the organizers here, I'll get to uh, joint work with him later. Um, anyway, uh, I'll be considering uh, for the most part, uh, the case of uh, um, electrical conductivity just because of its simplicity, um, but it, the results extend to other equations too. So let's just start with a very simple case. Here we've got a two phase body, omega with uh, uh, red and blue. And uh, um, yeah, so um, we've got the uh, conductivity equations here. Sigma one, um, whoops, sorry. Um, sigma one is the conductivity in phase one and sigma two in that phase two. Um, and these conductivity equations can be rewritten in terms of the current field, divergent free and electric field, which is a gradient of a potential. And uh, uh, one thing you notice is that the average uh, electric field in the body uh, can be evaluated just in terms of its say um, boundary value of the potential and the average current field uh, can be evaluated from the boundary value of the flux. So these are quantities that one can measure from boundary fields. Uh, Q is just the flux. Um, and. Uh, So, uh, of course, one's familiar with standard variational principles for this problem. Um, if you're unfamiliar with them, they're very straightforward to uh, uh, derive that uh, if we look at this quadratic form involving conductivity and uh, trial potential V bar, 
um, that this uh, quantity, which is basically the uh, power dissipation or some sort of energy, um, that this is minimized uh, when the trial potential V bar equals the actual potential V, when you fix the uh, trial potential to uh, the same value as the desired potential on the boundary. And then there's the dual variational principle, uh, Thompson variational principle that involves the current field J. And uh, in this sense here, that you've got this quadratic form again, which is minimized. In this case, you actually have to invoke the additional constraint on the field J, namely that it's divergence free inside the region omega, and that the flux of the trial field max matches the actual flux on the boundary. So they're two straightforward variational principles. Um, now, um, if we're interested in the response of bodies, the simplest possible boundary conditions one could have is namely just an affine uh, boundary condition. Um, so the potential is just a linear function around the boundary. Um, e naught here is the average value of the electric field. Um, if you put this uh, uh, boundary condition, then you can measure the average current field J0. Um, and then the relationship between J0 and E0 defines a sort of effective tensor, sigma D, D for Dirichlet, uh, associated with this problem. Um, in the case where there's a large separation of length scales so that uh, uh, we've got some sort of periodic material filling the body omega where this, the uh, period uh, cell size is much smaller than omega, then sigma D would in fact be the effective tensor. Um, another straightforward boundary condition is to, is to um, have specify the flux um, to be given by this expression here where J naught is constant and N is the um, uh, normal to the boundary. So this sort of um, boundary condition is compatible with a flux J zero, which is completely uniform uh, within the body. And, and again, one can measure the average electric field E zero, and then the relationship between E zero and J zero to find some effective tensor sigma N to the minus one. The minus one is just, um, put in there so it has the dimension of connectivity. So that defines sigma n. And again, that would be the effective tensor sigma star uh, if we had a homogenization. Um, now, if you apply the standard variational principles, um, then you can easily derive these sorts of bounds on sigma d and sigma n, um, namely arithmetic and harmonic mean averages of the conductivity. Uh, and these tensors are sandwiched between those. Um, one useful um, consequence of those bounds is that you can estimate the volume fraction of phase one uh, and the volume fraction of phase two um, using these measurements. So just from measurements around the boundary of the body, one can obtain bounds on the uh, size of the inclusion inside the body. Um, one can do better bounds. Um, so these sort of arithmetic harmonic mean bounds um, for conductivity had been well known uh, for composites um, since the time of Wiener in the early 1900s. Um, and then a breakthrough of Morat, Tatar, Lurie and Shikhaev, and Francois is here and so is Constantine. They derived in improved bounds for the effective tensor sigma star. Here D is the dimension of the body, which is two or three. Um, and sigma star is a tensor uh, and trace is the trace. So um, these actually are the tightest possible bounds uh, that one can actually get uh, for two phase composites. Um, they completely characterize the all possible tensor sigma star. Um, now for our problem, we don't have a separation of length scales, uh, but nonetheless, you can consider a body where you replicate um, 
uh, so this is actually a periodic composite material, and this is a unit cell. And inside the unit cell, you replicate your body uh, with various sizes to fill all space. Um, and uh, one, again, you can apply the uh, Dirichlet and Thompson variational principles. For the Dirichlet variational principles, a, a, a trial electric field can be one which is sort of uniform, basically uniform in the gaps here um, with affine boundary conditions around the uh, boundary. And, uh, and then uh, um, when you fill this, these inclusions fill all space, you've got some composite material, which is a two-phase composite material with some effective tensor sigma star that will actually depend upon how these uh, inclusions are positioned. Um, but using this trial field, you can easily see that sigma star is bounded above by sigma D and bounded below by sigma N. And then when you plug those into the Mirage uh, Tata Luri Shakayev bounds, you get these two inequalities at the bottom. Um, so they're one sided inequalities on sigma D and sigma N. And so again, these can be used in an inverse fashion to give you estimates of the volume fraction uh, of an inclusion inside a body. Um, so now I want to turn on to a, a different uh, problem as that, uh, uh, namely variational principles for inhomogeneous bodies. Um, well, we already mentioned the Dirichlet-Thompson variational principles, their minimization principles, uh, but you may want to ask about their extension to other problems, to acoustics, to elastodynamics, and to electromagnetism. And in this context, um, the uh, work in the field of composite materials, and in particular, the work of Shikaev and Gibiansky, um, plays an instrumental role. Um, so in the context, this context, we'll assume that the material has to be uh, lossy, in other words, absorbs energy, or the frequency omega has positive imaginary part, which means growing fields, which means that uh, instead of the material absorbing energy, more and more energy is building up inside the material. So it's a, they're both a little bit physically simple, similar. Um, so I mentioned Gibianski and Chikayev, they treated the case of quasi-static conductivity or uh, we'll actually look at uh, quasi-static dielectrics. It's basically the same equations. So here, epsilon of X is your dielectric tensor, E is your electric field, and D is the displacement field. So the same as the conductivity equations, but everything is complex now. Um, and uh, um, the real and imaginary parts uh, sort of dictate the uh, very temporal variations of the field. Um, basically, if I multiply these complex fields by e to the minus i omega t, take the real part, then they're the physical fields. Um, so um, from physical reasons, epsilon double prime of x, double prime means the imaginary part, prime means the real part. Uh, this is positive or non-negative. That reflects the, the epsilon double prime is related to absorption. So this reflects the fact that I've got a passive material where both phases absorb energy. Um, so uh, you can separate these equations, in particular the constitutive equations, into its real and imaginary parts, and you end up with this sort of constitutive law. And now you've got a, a, a quadratic form um, associated with the matrix here, which is actually saddle shaped because it has uh, both positive and negative um, parts. Um, one thing you can do though, and that was the key observation they made, is you can make partial Legendre transforms to convert saddle-shaped quadratic functions into convex quadratic funds, functions. And that's equivalent to rewriting the constitutive law uh, in this form here. Um, and this is uh, uh, quite nice because the fields on the left of the constitutive law and the fields on the right of the constitutive law 
um, both uh, lie in orthogonal spaces. Um, yeah. So, um, um, and the other thing that's nice is this tensor um, script epsilon here, or calligraphic epsilon here, uh, is actually now a symmetric positive definite tensor, and therefore all the variational principles apply. Um, so, in particular, uh, they have obtained this variational principles that if you look at this quadratic form here, so this is exactly the quadratic form associated with uh, uh, the equations, namely the quadratic form um, associated with uh, calligraphic epsilon sandwiched between this field here um, and itself. Um, so that's what we've got here. And now these are trial fields. Um, and if we look at this quadratic form uh, and then hold uh, V prime, remember the prime is the real part, uh, equals to V prime on the boundary and the flux D prime dot N equal to the actual flux on the boundary. Um, then when we minimize this over all these trial fields, the minimum uh, value satisfies the equations. Um, so this actually has been very, very useful. Um, one uh, example of where it's useful, uh, this is a more recent example. Um, although these, these bounds here, I sort of this shows how old I am now. These sort of date back to uh, 1980, uh, actually 1979, uh, when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> but, uh, um, but this sort of shows um, if I've got one material with uh, dielectric constant epsilon one, another with dielectric constant epsilon two, uh, then the effective dielectric constant, depending upon what's known about the composite, lies inside um, one of these sort of lens shaped regions. So um, this, uh, 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 okay, um, for example, uh, these apply to the diagonal elements of the dielectric constant, um, effective dielectric constant. And so this large shape region here is uh, what happens when you uh, don't assume anything about your material. And in one direction you can get an, if you just take a laminate geometry, you can get a, a arithmetic average that corresponds to the straight line here. Uh, and with the field orthogonal to the layers, you get uh, um, a harmonic average, which is this bound here. And so no matter what the geometry is, the diagonal elements of the dielectric constant relate in, in this region here. But most interesting is these cross H regions, which are the bounds. Um, so omega is now not the uh, body, of course. Uh, these cross H regions apply to isotropic composite materials. So they're the ones of most, most interest and they're the ones that show where the dielectric constant lies. Um, so there's uh, cross H regions, uh, omega double prime for D equals three, uh, that's three dimensions, and this is two dimensions. So the two dimensional case here um, is actually optimal and was known to be optimal uh, from the beginning in 1979. Uh, and I'd found it was uh, attained by uh, geometries of uh, uh, doubly coded disks. Um, and, uh, uh, and then as you vary the geometry, you cover everything in the, uh, or, or um, yeah, everything along the boundary, and then you can easily fill the whole region. Um, the interesting case is the three-dimensional case here. And uh, this is something that uh, Christian Kern, Owen Miller, and myself uh, explored recently. There's a reference below. We were interested in how optimal these uh, um, bounds were. And uh, here there were sort of various different geometries. Some of these look anisotropic, but uh, um, that's just the starting point. There's a way of uh, 
uh, creating an isotropic material from this laminate geometry just by tracing the trace of the uh, effective dielectric tensor. And that gives you one point on the bounce here. These points were known before I'd found them out. Um, but Christian actually discovered uh, three more points on this bound. And, uh, um, and these are basically hierarchical laminate materials uh, that uh, correspond to these. Um, and so basically this bound here looks pretty optimal. Um, so that seems to be almost optimal. Um, but what about this sort of second arc here that was bounds that? That actually um, is, uh, I'd actually suggested it wasn't attainable, uh, but using these variational principles of Gibiansky and uh, Shikayev, one gets this sort of improved bound given by this red uh, region here that actually corresponds to a geometry of doubly coded spheres filling all space. So, um, so that more or less completes the story and it actually shows what uh, geometries absorb the, the most amount of energy. And, uh, um, and in particular, there was sort of uh, interest in this by Owen Miller and Stephen Johnson and collaborators in trying to find um, uh, optimal shaped uh, particles in clouds uh, that absorb the most amount of energy. So you can think of, they were interested in potential applications for smoke screens uh, that uh, to try to optimize the, um, the uh, shape of the metal particles in a uh, smoke screen to make it as effective as possible for giving weight. Um, anyway, um, uh, if we go back to the equations of, uh, um, um, so we are interested in variational principles now for acoustics, elastodynamics, and Maxwell equations. And the key observation here is that these equations uh, at constant frequency can actually be written in a similar form to the quasi-static dielectric ones. Um, so again, the fields on the left and the fields on the right on the constituent relations lie actually in orthogonal subspaces. Um, in particular, if you uh, uh, take the inner product of uh, this with this, it can be written as a divergence. Uh, and so um, uh, expressed in terms of boundary value. Um, and similarly for elastodynamics or Maxwell equations. Um, and also for the Schrodinger equations, for the Schrodinger equations, um, the, uh, the analog of having uh, the frequency uh, positive imaginary part is having the energy having the positive imaginary part. Um, Anyway, um, once you realize this, uh, and then the other thing that's nice is that this tensor Z in the constitutive law has the property that its imaginary part, Z double prime, is uh, positive definite. So you can apply the Gibiansky shikayev tricks to the, all of these equations as well. And um, in particular, just for example, if we focus on electromagnetism, one has Maxwell's equations. E is the electric field and H is the magnetic field. Epsilon here is the dielectric uh, tensor and mu is the magnetic permeability. Uh, J here is, a, is an external current source. It uh, drives the equations. Um, and then uh, as for um, the uh, dielectric constant case, one can define these positive definite matrices, uh, M here is the inverse of the magnetic permeability tensor. And, uh, and then you get a, a variational principle uh, that this is minimized um, when uh, um, the uh, trial fields equal the actual fields, um, provided one fixes the uh, tangential components of the trial fields um, and the actual fields uh, to match uh, the real part of the electric field and the imaginary part of the magnetic field. So these are uh, uh, 
uh, boundary conditions are a little bit uh, unusual, but uh, actually you can treat uh, other boundary conditions as well. And that's in uh, my paper with John Willis. Um, so, um, and then uh, in the case when the magnetic permeability is real, uh, the variational principle simplifies a bit, just involves now a trielectric field. Uh, and now one has to fix the tangential components of not just the trielectric field, but also uh, this quantity here, um, which involves the gradient or the curl of the electric field. Um, so, um, it's sort of interesting that uh, we've got all these variational principles, but can we understand things in a broader framework? And uh, in this framework, let's go to what I call the abstract theory of composites, um, where one takes a Hilbert space, or it could even be a vector space, which is the direct sum of three orthogonal spaces, which are called U, E, and J. Um, and then we, if we have an operator L from H to H, which could be say positive definite or positive definite imaginary part. Um, and then uh, for all E naught in U, in the space U, we solve this equation here, um, uh, where J naught is in U as well. Uh, J is in this subspace J here, and E is the subspace E. Um, so, uh, and then once we've done that, um, then we, um, let's see. Um, yeah, once we've done that, um, then the relationship between J naught and E naught defines our effective uh, operator L star. And, uh, um, so in periodic conducting composites, H is just periodic fields that are square integrable over the unit cells. Uh, U is the constant vector fields. Um, e is gradients of periodic potentials. Uh, J are uh, divergence free fields um, that have a zero average value over the unit cell. And so, E naught plus capital E is just your total electric field. J naught plus J is your total current, current field. And L is your local conductivity and L star is your effective conductivity. Um, so now let's look at this framework in the context of a body and what governs the general response of the body is what's called the Dirichlet Neumann map. Um, so we've got our body, which contains a red phase and a blue phase, um, though it could be more complicated. Um, and uh, the Dirichlet Neumann map uh, gives the uh, relationship between Dirichlet um, um, boundary conditions and the Neumann uh, fluxes, if you like. Uh, so we specify a boundary potential V naught around our body, boundary of body, and then we measure the flux n dot j through the body. And uh, then the uh, uh, mapping from one to the other defines the Dirichlet to Norman map. Uh, so this is a um, fun example where they do this uh, for electrical impedance tomography. Uh, this is a paper of Cheney et al in 1999. This was meant to be trying to recover um, the uh, shape of uh, heart and lungs from uh, such bound, the Dirichlet to Neumann map. So this is a discrete uh, version of the Dirichlet to Neumann map. Um, so um, actually the abstract theory of composite extends to this too. Um, so now we let U not just be constant fields or uniform fields, we actually let them to be uh, anything which uh, uh, derives from a harmonic potential V with Laplacian equals zero. And then uh, you consist of uh, gradients of uh, those harmonic potentials. Uh, e consists of fields which are gradients of potentials where those potentials are zero on the boundary. And J 
consists of divergence-free fields with zero flux on the boundary. Um, and you notice that the fields in U, namely gradients of harmonic potentials, may actually be identified by the boundary value of the potential or by the boundary value of the flux. And so there's two ways to um, look at them. Um, and so um, now um, the uh, uh, constitutive law um, is exactly uh, that associated with the abstract problem in the theory of composites. So this is a, a total current field inside our body. This is a total electric field inside the body, uh, which is decomposed into a part which has a gradient of a harmonic, associated with gradients of harmonic potentials. And uh, again, gradients of harmonic potentials. And uh, um, so this is exactly the problem we solve for the Dirichlet to know that. And, uh, um, and then if we knew uh, the effective operator from U to U, um, then uh, from the abstract theory of composites, we have that uh, uh, J naught is equal to L star E naught. We know this operator L star. Um, but this is exactly the Dirichlet to Neumann map because the va boundary values with J dot N uh, allow us to determine the boundary flux and the uh, potential about the boundary associated with E zero corresponds to the specified potential of our Dirichlet boundary conditions. And so viewed in this light, we can actually understand that the variational principles in the abstract theory of composites correspond to the Dirichlet and Thompson ones. And in the abstract theory of composites, one can use these uh, uh, gibianski shikarev type uh, tricks. And so um, it's uh, natural. And then the analytic properties actually extend to the Dirichlet norm map as well. Um, so for conductivity, the analytic properties of L stars are a function of uh, sigma one and sigma two. Um, that, that we use to obtain those uh, uh, lens shape bounds with uh, David Bergman. Um, anyway, that's, uh, um, um, yeah, okay. So let's uh, move on to the last topic that I want to uh, discuss, um, which is the extension of the theory of exact relations to inhomogeneous bodies. So the theory of exact relations is concerned with uh, uh, exact identities satisfied by effective tensors uh, for composite materials. Um, so a classic exact relation uh, go goes back to, I guess, Keller, Mendelssohn, Dykney. Keller was in the 1962, I guess, a long time ago. Um, they'd noticed that if the, uh, our, um, tensor field, conductivity tensor field sigma x uh, has constant determinant for all x inside the body, then the effective tensor shares that same determinant. Another way of saying that is that the manifold M consisting of tensors sigma with constant determinant is stable under homogenization. So this is the picture we've got here. This is intensive space. We've got some manifold M uh, and we have uh, uh, two uh, tensors, L1 and L2, for example. Um, and uh, um, when uh, sigma of X lies on this manifold, then sigma star lies on this manifold. So another way of saying it is that this manifold is actually stable under homogenization. And, uh, and in particular, it must be stable if we mix two materials, L1 and L2. Um, and the goal of the theory of exact relations or identify manifolds uh, that have this property. Um, and okay, a lot of names here, right? Uh, so many scientists actually discovered these exact relations one at a time. I won't go th through the list. Um, but uh, actually, uh, Yuri Grabrowski has uh, discovered hundreds more. 
um, and many sort of intersections of others. And uh, I don't know uh, with his workers that uh, will appreciate it, but uh, uh, it's uh, actually quite incredible. Um, and he has a book that summarizes that. And my old book has a number of chapters also sort of dealing with this uh, uh, question. So uh, what was the first major breakthrough here? And this was uh, um, dates back to uh, Yuri in uh, uh, 1998. Um, and that's uh, um, since a uh, exact relationship holds for all geometries, it must certainly hold for laminar geometries. And uh, um, so the idea is if we've got our uh, manifold M, and if we two, pick two tenses L1 and L2 on that, manifold and then laminate them together, um, then the laminate must also lie in that manifold. And uh, what's uh, useful here is there's this transformation here um, that uh, maps lamination into a li linear transformation. Um, so that had actually been noted, uh, such transformations have been noted noted uh, as far back as work of Bacchus and rediscovered by Luc Tartar, but uh, this particular transformation seems the most useful. Um, so we've got this sort of fractional linear transformation of L. L0 here is just a constant tensor called a reference tensor. And gamma of N, uh, that sort of depends upon your equations. Um, it depends upon the direction of lamination N. Um, so N is orthogonal to the layers. Um, anyway, if you do this transformation from L to K um, and, and pick L naught on your manifold as well, uh, then uh, um, the formula of the effective tensor uh, is actually just a linear relationship. Um, basically W of N of L star is equal to the average value of W in of L. Um, and therefore, um, in this case base, um, the uh, uh, exact relationship must be a, a linear relationship. Um, and so, um, so that implies that this uh, manifold M gets mapped under this uh, transformation to a subspace, a linear subspace. But if we pick a different direction of lamination M, we get uh, again a linear sub subspace. But that's rather interesting because if we do this nonlinear transformation from uh, this K space to this K space, um, given by this uh, transformation, we're actually man mapping our linear space to a linear space. So this is a nonlinear transformation, which maps a linear sp subspace to a linear subspace. So something has to be going on here to allow this to be possible. And you can expand the nonlinear transformation um, here, epsilon. And so the, if it's linear, the only term should be this term here. All these other terms must disappear. Um, and so in particular, by examining this term here, we get that this, uh, sorry, it doesn't actually disappear. It must lie in the subspace. Um, so we get that this term here must lie in the subspace for all M and for all K in the subspace K. And uh, uh, so there's this algebraic condition that needs to be satisfied. Um, but once that's satisfied, what's neat is that all the other terms lie in the subspace too. And so then the search for these exact relations just becomes an algebraic search uh, for um, subspaces uh, K that have this, satisfy this algebraic property where A of M here is this uh, gamma N minus gamma N. And so that sort of depends upon the equations that you're dealing with, whether they're elasticity or conductivity, they sort of take a different form. Um, so uh, just for uh, conductivity, uh, two-dimensional conductivity, uh, that uh, gamma of N takes this form, 
gamma of m takes this form um, and a of m is then because it's two dimensional this is a two by two matrix so this is a two by two trace free matrix um, and now we can take k as a space of two by two symmetric trace free matrices um, and now the product of two trace three symmetric matrices is actually not trace free and not symmetric but if with three matrices it is trace free and symmetric so this here corresponds to our a of m this is in our subspace k and this is in our subspace k as well and the result is in our subspace k and so that's satisfied and that's the relationship behind the keller dykeny mendelssohn line um, the search for these algebra uh, subspaces satisfying these algebraic relationships is by no means simple. And so I refer to uh, you to uh, Yuri Gabrowski's book to have a look at that. Um, um, the second major breakthrough, uh, so this was myself uh, with Yuri and Dan Sage, uh, is that uh, uh, we could actually extend this uh, to all geometries, not just laminate geometries. And uh, uh, the key here was to use expansions, series expansions for the effective tenses uh, that uh, actually applied uh, to any composite material. Um, and so, um, so here, um, okay, there's this uh, um, operator gamma here. This is now, it is related to that gamma n. Now this is something that acts locally in Fourier space. And uh, um, okay, you have to go to Fourier space to evaluate it. Um, I mean, that's a, uh, takes a nice, nice value. I, I'm not gonna put down what it is, um, but uh, um, you have your K star, that's your effective tensor. Now we have this WM of uh, L star. And so M is here, M, M can be arbitrary now. Um, so this is a similar sort of fractional linear transformation, but now instead of gamma of N, we replace it by M. Uh, and we do see the same thing for our local tensor L of X, transform that into K of X. And then we actually have a series expansion for K star in terms of K. And uh, when you write it out, it sort of looks like this and it involves this tensor A. And so this is actually looking very, very similar to like the laminate case. And, uh, uh, and you end up with an algebraic condition that if this algebraic condition holds, uh, then the exact relationship holds for all geometries. So uh, this is uh, M here where free to choose a natural choice of m here is just gamma of n, m m uh, so this would then be exactly the same as uh, what we had for uh, the laminate case uh, but there one had that it only needed to hold when k1 equals k2 and here we had needed to hold for all k1 and k2 in the subspace um, and so um, generally these uh, necessary and sufficient conditions collide, but there are examples where uh, exact relations hold for uh, laminate geometries, but not for all microstructures. And uh, yeah, so Yuri uh, obtained such an example uh, of that. Uh, quite interesting uh, um, involving quaternions and things. So anyway, um, um, so that uh, is that. And now the uh, third major breakthrough is that uh, um, you can actually extend these to the case of uh, uh, where we have bodies, not periodic materials. So if we consider periodic materials, I could choose a, a dashed region around it and uh, define this as my body omega. And uh, um, somehow um, I should have mentioned too, um, the uh, um, result of, of this analysis showed that not only were the uh, uh, 
tensor field, effect of tensor on the manifold, but also the polarization fields are actually constrained to take values in K. So um, polarization fields are the uh, P here. Um, okay, I'll show what they are in a minute. Um, okay, I'll skip this in the interest of time. This was just an example. Um, and uh, okay, so going back, um, the, uh, um, with the right boundary conditions here, the polarization field inside the body uh, must take values in this subspace K, and that actually gives you additional information about the boundary value fields. And so uh, this is this examples. And then this uh, new boundary field equalities, they in some sense generalize the divergence field theorem. They don't re result from integration by parts, but rather than uh, by algebraic properties satisfied by the operator gamma. Um, and so there are these sort of hidden identities that go beyond integration by parts and uh, still allow one to deduce exact identities. Um, so at this point, uh, I um, want to sort of close things here. Uh, I'll just sort of skip the details and thank everyone. <laughs> thank you, Professor Graham, for a fine lecture. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. So much. So I think there is one question. Are you able to read the question or otherwise can I read? You can read in the chat box. Uh, sorry, in the uh, chat box. box? Chat, chat, chat box. Yeah. Okay. Um, we can read otherwise. Yeah, if you could read it. Sorry, I just uh, not getting the chat box just now. Yeah, it's from Yulia Orlik. Your bounds count for the volume fraction, shape, and orientation of ellipsoid and layers. Did you investigate the effect of number of contact points and surfaces? And the next effect is the contrast and stabilities. Example in mechanics and acoustics, thin fibers can buckle, vibrate. Electroconductive small layers can have a Faraday effect. Cracks and corners bring some singularities in stresses and fluxes. Could you comment on non bounds for such effects? Yeah. Um, so, um, so, first of all, it has to be stressed that here I'm dealing with linear equations. Um, and so, such, such things as uh, uh, buckling, uh, it sort of li lies outside that. Um, yeah, so um, within the um, theory of composites, one can also deal with nonlinear uh, things. Um, and uh, so the framework of compensate compactness or uh, in particular Luc Tata's work uh, is useful for that. And I have a paper with uh, Sergei Surkov uh, where we look at composites where there's a nonlinear relationship for conductivity, for example, between J and E and one can get bounds. Um, and, and I guess the second point to emphasize is within the linear regime, uh, the uh, bounds apply for any uh, shaped in, in, uh, inclusion. And for example, the bounds at the beginning where one has affine uh, conditions are also valid for any shaped bodies. Um, there was work of uh, Nimit, Nasa and Hori uh, that derive bounds sort of uh, analogous to those of uh, Hash and Strickman or Luri Shikaev and Mora and Tata, um, where they assumed that the outer body was ellipsoidal in shape. But in fact, that assumption is not necessary. Um, so I think I answered the last part of that section question, but I, I'm not sure I understood the first part. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, thank you from Urlik. Okay, great. Any, maybe it's a really a long day of the conference. Well, <laughs> yeah, particularly for you guys in India. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for staying awake. So. Yeah. 
but it's good so we heard some two interesting lectures both yours and professor luri it was a really wonderful both of them both the lectures thank you so, so we thank once again and again we meet tomorrow morning okay so thanks Sorry. to all the speaker of today yeah, and see you tomorrow you. so thank you all thank you for the call. so tomorrow is the last day bye everyone okay bye everybody okay, bye. bye 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 everyone